So, welcome to my real world MacBook M1 Pro review. In this video, I'm gonna try my best to do a few things. Number one, try and explain to you a few things that I wish I knew before purchasing this machine. Also, compare this machine to a few other machines, so some higher end Windows devices, some older MacBooks, and some other Macs with M1 silicon. And also try and discuss why this thing is 2,600 pounds on paper, sat there with 16 gigs of RAM, and discuss ultimately whether that really matters. No, this was not sent to me by Apple, and if you stick around you will see this thing get absolutely hammered later by some of its Windows counterparts. Secondly, the specs inside of this thing. This is the M1 Pro, not the M1 Max. It has a 10 core CPU, 16 core GPU, 16 gigs of RAM, and a 1 terabyte SSD. That is the machine I'm using and have bought for myself. Now, my real love for MacBooks started back in 2015, which to this day is around six years ago. And at the time, I was running a daily vlog on YouTube where I was making a video every single day about what I was doing in that day. And I was about to embark on a really special journey. I was gonna take my camera and my audience and myself to Australia and New Zealand for around a month, try and do loads of traveling whilst at the same time still creating one high quality 4K video every every single day. And the machine I ended up on, and in fact the only machine at the time that would do the job, was the 2015 MacBook Pro. Now I was able to chop together 4K footage in the timeline without a hitch. And let's say the video that I was making was around 10 minutes, it would always take around 10 minutes to render. That is real time 4K rendering, which is insane, almost unheard of back in 2015. Now after 2015, for Apple's laptops, everything went downhill. They basically took away all of the things I loved about my 15 inch MacBook, bar the performance with the newer models. The nice keyboard with decent travel, gone. The SD card slot, gone. MagSafe, gone. Robust design, gone. The only positive things that came out of the MacBooks that were made between 2016 and 2020 was the larger trackpad, which here you can see, and USB-C, which is on this laptop. Gives me like a warm fuzziness inside, and that's because I think it reminisces me to the past, reminisces me to the time that I loved editing on my older MacBooks, and this feels like those older MacBooks in the best way possible. When you put this laptop side by side with the 2019 MacBook Pro 16 inch, you can really see and feel how much sturdier the new MacBook is. You can definitely feel that added weight that comes along with having a bigger battery inside, but I wouldn't see that as a major downside as it makes the whole chassis feel a bit bigger and from there, the whole laptop genuinely feels more robust. The only way I can really describe this to you over video is if you actually try and hinge both of the laptops, so the 2019 and the 2021, there's actually quite a lot of flex in the 2019 uh, actual laptop lid, whereas that is completely non-existent on the new laptop. When you hinge open this laptop, it feels sturdier, and I like that because obviously you've got to hinge over this thing to actually use it. Obviously, I've already mentioned all of the new ports. One of the main downsides with the new ports is the HDMI specifically. It's HDMI 2.0 instead of 2.1. What does that mean? Basically, you can't get 4K 120 out of here, which is a shame because one of the main reasons I'm keeping this laptop is that the display is 120 hertz. You can't get that out of the HDMI. It's capped at 4K 60. Great if you are in a pinch. What else do I like ports wise? MagSafe is great. With it, it charges the laptop to 50% in about 30 minutes, which is groundbreaking because you can get an entire day's use and probably more light out of this laptop with 50% in the bank. The only other two visual changes are the black keyboard background, which somehow makes this laptop feel newer than last gen. And then obviously you've got that notch up at the top, which I've quickly just come to ignore because the rest of the display on this laptop is amazing. It's basically a little baby pro display XDR. But before we talk about this screen though, it's time for a little word from our sponsor, Private Internet Access. Now, anything you do online, it would be wise to use a VPN to protect yourself from people like your ISP, 
network admins and the government sensor from spying on your information, data that goes to and from your online devices. VPNs are also great for helping you overcome things like geo restrictions, which restrict you from where you are in the world to the content that you can actually see. PIA's VPN provides unrestricted access to servers in over 75 countries, with many servers actually dedicated specifically for streaming, which means yes, PIA aren't a slow VPN. Plus, PIA is one of the few VPNs that fully supports P2P file sharing and torrenting for those people that want to do that over a VPN. PIA have got over 30 million downloads, they're one of the world's safest and most used VPN, and PIA never record or store user data. They have a no logs policy that has also been proven multiple times in court. So you know they're safe and you know they're not out to get you, which is great when you choose a VPN. They have dedicated apps for pretty much every platform, including Windows, Mac, Linux, Android, and iOS. So if you're out and on your phone, it's no biggie. Or if you sat at home wanting to hide your data from your ISP, then they've got you covered. PIA is highly customizable. It has tons of advanced features. They've got 24 seven around the clock support should you require it. And best of all, PIA does not break the bank, coming in cheaper than most other VPNs out there. There's a special deal for our TechFlow subscribers if you use the link in our description, which obviously helps support our channel. You guys can get PIA for just £1.63 a month for three years, and that'll get you an extra four months for free. That is literally, I've done the math, about £20 a year for the best VPN you can get, completely unrestricted access to it. And they've also got a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you just don't like it, you can return it and get your money back. So a huge thanks to Private Internet Access for sponsoring this video. And remember to use the link in our description to help support our channel and you guys can take advantage of that awesome, crazy offer. Now, back to our MacBook review. Now, I want to give an honorable mention to the audio system that Apple have somehow fitted into this laptop. It's almost a little bit wizard-like because it's, it has no business being this good. You've probably seen a load of other people raving on about it, but I want to put this head-to-head -head with a few other higher-end laptops. Now, the display. It's incredible on paper and in real life. But before I tell you the specs, I just want to tell you that you would be really hard pressed to find even a full blown like desktop monitor with the specs that this screen has for less than the price of this entire laptop. So it's a mini LED panel that can produce up to 10 bit color. It's got 1,600 nits peak brightness when you're in HDR, and obviously it's in the 16 by 10 aspect ratio with an almost 4K resolution. Now, it doesn't stop there. This is obviously a variable refresh rate that can go all the way up to 120 hertz frames per second, which just looks buttery smooth and makes this laptop want to stay in my bag because obviously whenever you're using the laptop you're looking at the screen and having all of the animations and all of the mouse movements be really buttery smooth makes this thing even if it isn't, which it is, feel loads faster just by having a smoother screen. It's something that I've always said to people, higher refresh for the win. Now obviously they've managed to do all of that whilst at the same time making the bezels significantly thinner than the last gen MacBook and the bezels on the side and on the top are the exact same thickness which is something you can't find on the previous MacBook either and I think it looks much more uniform on this design. The only downside to it, like everybody says, is the notch but it's not really even a downside because you're still getting the exact same screen real estate the way you should think about this notch is that it's eating into the screen that you didn't even have before. So the screen has just got a little bit taller, right, to accommodate the bar at the top. When you use applications in full screen, 
the apps aren't that much bigger. It's just a complete misconception. It's not a bigger screen, it's just more screen to accommodate the status bar, which is there now all of the time. Now, okay, how do these laptops actually perform? Like, how do they do their job? There's loads of different ways to test these laptops, but there's also loads of different ways in which people use these laptops. So I'm just gonna test them in the ways that I know best with Premiere Pro exports. So um, yeah. Play the clip. So here we have the new MacBook on the left hand side, along with the i9 previous generation MacBook all the way on the right. In the middle left, we've got the Asus ZenBook Duo with the Intel i9 10th generation, 32 gig of RAM and an RTX 3070. The second Windows machine is the Zephyrus with again an i9, this time the 11th generation, 32 gig of RAM and an RTX 3080 instead of a 70. The ZenBook with the 10th gen i9 came surprisingly first, followed by the new M1 Pro MacBook, then the 2019 i9 MacBook, and then shortly after that, the Zephyrus completed its render. The new MacBook came first as far as least battery drained during the export, losing only 3%, the ZenBook lost 5%, the i9 MacBook lost 9%, and then the Zephyrus lost the most with a 10% loss. What do these results tell us? Well, number one, first and foremost, is that the new MacBook with the M1 Pro chip can keep up with the highest end Windows laptops that are currently on the market. But it also tells us, I think, something a little bit more important than that if we specifically look only at the Windows machines. How did the i9 10th generation with the 3070 beat out the i9 11th generation with a 3080? I'll tell you exactly why. Optimization, something I was talking about earlier. Controversial, I know, but I'm gonna say it here first. In 2021, specs really don't matter anymore. Like, they just don't matter anymore. Now into the next test. This is an interesting one because we've got Final Cut Pro, which is obviously Apple software running on the new MacBook, on the older i9 Intel MacBook, and then a Mac mini with the older M1 chip. Funnily enough here, the older i9 MacBooks takes the cake and then six seconds later, the new MacBook finishes following by the new M1 Mac a further 11 seconds later. And what can we take away from this test? And well, actually, despite how much I absolutely love this machine and would recommend it to anybody that has the money to spend on one, maybe you could reconsider what you're looking for, considering you can pick up the M1 Mac Mini and all of the hardware, like a mouse, keyboard, uh, monitor, to get you up and running for less than this machine if you're willing to sacrifice literally 15 to 20 seconds on your render. What I'm saying is the performance differences versus the price differences are huge here. Like the diminishing return on this machine isn't very good. You would be fine with the M1 Mac Mini for under 600 quid. And that's really saying something, isn't it? When this is over two and a half thousand pounds. So, some final thoughts and the reasons as to why I really like this machine. Now, I've already mentioned the great keyboard and mouse, which is something really, really important on the laptop. I've already mentioned the great screen, which again is something really, really important on a laptop. I've already mentioned some little peripheral bits, like the great audio quality, which for me is really, really important on the laptop. It has a great battery life and ability to charge really fast, which is, again, a great thing to have on a laptop. Performance and numbers aside, this machine is something that you should want to pick up just because of those specific things. They make this thing what it is. This is the best battery life I've ever seen on a laptop this powerful. Looking at my battery percentage is no longer an anxiety, but a shock to see how much that I've still got left in the tank. And because this is an Apple chip, it's the whole point of this laptop, it has those high efficiency cores, which I didn't think I was gonna see any benefit from or even use because all of the things that I do are high intensity things. But those low intensity cores really help with things like waking the laptop up. So let's say the laptop's been sat on the side for two days. You would open this laptop up and the screen would come on. You would be presented with this in a flash like you would with your phone. You pick your phone up and the screen comes on. That is what this laptop is like to have around. With the last Intel MacBooks, if it had been sat there for a few days and you opened up the lid, it would take three or four seconds for anything to actually happen. So those, for those reasons alone, it makes this thing feel like it belongs in the future. 
The only other main downside to this is the software and that software that isn't optimized for the M1. For example, something that I use in my daily work life and personal life is Dropbox. Dropbox have not, and still to this day, have not released a native M1 Apple M Pro uh, launcher for their app. It's still running through Rosetta, which means whenever I'm uploading any of my videos to Dropbox, it's using about 40% of my CPU because it's having to do it through the Rosetta translation. But obviously, I mean, obviously, fingers crossed, people are gonna start releasing their optimized apps for this new machine. I mean, surely it's only a matter of time before everybody's on board, right? My final thoughts are, if you need a new laptop now and have the money to spend on one of these machines, whether it's not even the pro version, just a laptop with an M1 chip in it, do it now, right? Because I think that these laptops are great now, but I also think that they will still be great in five years time. And that is something that you've really got to weigh up when you're spending this much money on a product. Is it good now? And is it gonna be good in five years time? And I really think that these things have been built to last. So there you guys have it. My name's been Alex, this has been Techflow. I love this thing, I'm keeping it in my bag. I'll see you in the next one, peace. Oh, 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 oh,